We come together on this Lord's Day morning to worship before the throne of our Creator. It is a blessing to be gathered as the people of God. We are glad to see you. It is good to see everyone, especially those who are visiting with us. We are glad that you're here and we want you to know that we're thankful that you are here. If you have questions about those things that are said or done, we encourage you to come to us. Let's talk about those things. Let's follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the Scriptures teach. Imagine the scene. A man in his mid to, to late 30s has been studying in his Bible the importance of expressing appreciation, expressing gratitude to other people. And he realized as he studied these things that, that he had some unfinished business with his dad. So he called his father on the telephone. His dad answered, Hi, Dad. It's me. Oh, hi, son. I'll get your mother. <laughs> no, Dad. It's you I wanted to talk to. Long pause. Why? Do you need money? <laughs> well, no, no, Dad. It's just that I've been remembering a lot about you, Dad. I've been remembering about all of the things that, that you did for me and for us as I was growing up, working all those years and, and supporting us. Dad, my, my life is going well right now, and it's because of, of what you did to get me started. I, I just thought about it and realized I never really thanked you the way I should. Silence on the other end of the line. The son continued, I want to tell you thanks, Dad, and that I love you. Long pause. Son, you've been drinking. <laughs> Expressing thanks to other people should become part of who we are as the Lord's people. Showing our gratitude to other people should simply be built into us. It should not be something that, that's so out of place that somebody thinks something is wrong when we start telling them how much we appreciate them. And, and as we open our Bibles today in the book of 1 Thessalonians, we come to a passage that is about giving thanks. And, and this isn't something new in the book. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul begins the book saying, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And, and as we have continued in our study of 1 Thessalonians, we find Paul returning to this idea as we begin in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, moving forward, he begins saying, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. As Paul was writing to these Christians about overflowing, abounding in love and holiness, what, what the Christian life should be, he's pointing out here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, that, that he was thankful for his brethren. And, and in fact, that's, that's what this section is. Thankful for you. And he gives them two reasons for which he is thankful for his brethren. And, and those are the same reasons for which, well, for which I'm thankful for my brethren. When I get something you don't. I get to stand up on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, and I get to look out and see the church family. I get to see your faces. You, you, you see maybe the back of, of the heads of, of a few people and, and a few that we talk to. I get to see my brethren. And, and just like Paul, there are so many times that I'm say, saying and thinking, I'm thankful for you. There are so many reasons for this and, and reasons for which we all can and should be thankful for one another. And to add to that, as we study these things today, I also want us all to ask the question, am I doing those things? Am I living in the way that I should so that those who are, are spiritual, like the Apostle Paul, would be thankful for me? 
So, so think about those two things that Paul brings to, to the attention of his brethren. He says, I am thankful for you because you received God's word. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, he wrote, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Friends, when we open the pages of the Bible, we're not just looking at opinions and judgments of men. That's, that's not what it is. Instead, we are looking at the inspired Word of God. It has been translated into our own language so that you and I can read it. We can comprehend it. And as we study the Scriptures, we find that that is exactly what the Bible claims to be. In fact, more than 3,000 times in the Old and New Testament together, we find the claim made that it is in fact the inspired Inspired Word of God. One of those we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. As Paul begins by saying, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word for inspiration here was a word that meant God breathed. That is, all Scripture comes from God. All Scripture comes out from God. All Scripture is God breathed, given by inspiration of God. Sometimes though it's not quite so clear. Sometimes the, the statement that's made is a little bit more subtle than that. I want you to see one of those with me in Mark chapter 12 and verse 36. There Mark is recording for us something that Jesus was saying. Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament here in Mark 12. He's quoting from Psalm 110 and verse 1 uh, that David called that one who was to come, the Messiah, the Christ, David called Christ Lord. And Jesus is going to use that to, to make an important argument, but I want you to see how Jesus spoke about this. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 36, here's how Jesus said it. He said, For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. What a subtle way to put it. What an interesting turn of phrase. For David himself said, by the Holy Spirit. David didn't say that. He didn't write that by his own invention. But instead, it was the message that was given to him. And again, we find statements of this nature claiming inspiration more than three thousand times in the Bible. And the reality is the Bible does not just make the claim. It goes on to, to well to prove it. To, to give evidence for the claim. We see it in different ways. Sometimes it's by the remarkable unity uh, of the Bible. Forty different inspired writings from all walks of life. I mean, there's a priest and a shepherd and a king and a tax collector. There are fishermen, rich and poor alike. I mean, uh, from all walks of life, writing over a period of 1,500 years, and yet in the Bible, we get a single volume when we put it all together that has one theme. The salvation of man by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to the glory of the Father. Let me assure you, human beings can't do that on their own. Human beings could not put together a volume over a period of 1,500 years written by different people from all walks of life in different languages and have it have the kind of unity of theme, unity that we see in the Bible. Only God can do that. It's one evidence that the Bible is inspired. It's not the only one. There is also the historical accuracy that we find in the Bible. Well, we find over and over again the Bible mentions people and places and events and, and the Bible turns out to be right even when sometimes people question why the Bible would, would mention a group of people or, or would mention a particular place. An example of that, in the Old Testament we see a group of people called the Hittites and for a very long time. Skeptics of the Bible had a heyday with the word Hittite. They said there were never Hittites there. You've got, they couldn't have been there. There were no Hittites at the time that the Bible says, in the place where the Bible says they just didn't exist. And then eventually, 
archaeology and history come along and show, oh, by the way, the Hittites were there just like the Bible says. They were there at the right time just like the Bible says. And we find that over and over again, whether it's a group of people or, or, or a particular word that's used of, of a government official in the book of Acts, over and over the Bible shows itself to be historically accurate. But that's not the greatest evidence for the inspiration of the Bible. Perhaps the strongest evidence that the Bible is inspired is fulfilled prophecy. And I want you to think about this. There are many places we could go, but, but in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28. We've got the prophet Isaiah speaking God's message. The Lord says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and He shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Now that message was given by Isaiah saying the time is going to come that there's going to be this conqueror. His name is Cyrus and he is going to allow for the rebuilding of Jerusalem, for the rebuilding of the temple. And here's what's interesting. Isaiah recorded this. Isaiah wrote this before Israel had even gone into captivity. It's before the temple and the city had been destroyed by the Babylonians. He wrote it before Cyrus was even born. And yet, when the time came, there was that Persian king, Cyrus, who was in the right place at the right time to, to tell God's people to go home, to rebuild the city, to rebuild the temple. It all happened just as the prophet had said. And we find things like this. Statements of fact given long before it could ever come about. We find it in the Bible over and over and over again. The Bible is inspired. And so as Paul wrote to his brethren, he said, we thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you received it as the word of God. You received his message as being inspired. And that's exactly what you and I see in each other as Christians. We look out, we see one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a people who recognize that, that this book is not just a, a collection of, of wisdom, although there's great wisdom in it. It's not just a bunch of sayings, although there are some good sayings in it. It's not just saying, well, here's a, a way to live. It's saying this is God giving the way to live. Because this is God's inspired word. I thank God, Paul said. Because you received God's Word, let's give thanks for one another. But Paul wasn't finished. He went on to say in the second place, I give thanks for you because you have endured suffering. 1 Thessalonians 2, now beginning with verse 14, he went on to say, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus, for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from Judeans. How did the Christians at Thessalonica imitate the Christians in Judea? That is, the land around Jerusalem, the land of Judah. How did they receive the Word? How did they imitate the church in that area? Well, there are a lot of ways, but what Paul is writing about here has to do particularly with what they went through. He said, you know, just as, as they felt persecution, they had persecution from their own countrymen, you have persecution from your own countrymen. The word that Paul uses there in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14 was not just saying you've been persecuted by other Gentiles, but instead it was a word that, that had to do with fellow residents of your city. It was a word that said these are your neighbors. The ones you see when you go about your, your daily work. These are the ones you see when you go to the marketplace, to the square of the city. Anytime you're out and about, these are the ones that you see. And Paul said, they're the ones who have persecuted you. They're the ones who have treated you badly. And in that way, you're imitating the church in Judea. But, but he wasn't finished. We keep reading 1 Thessalonians 2.15. He, he begins to outline exactly what the persecutors had done to the church in Judea. They, they killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and, and they persecuted 
us. They, they killed Jesus. They killed the prophets. They persecuted, that is, uh, to pursue out. They chased us down, chased us out of Jerusalem at one point. Paul says that's what they did to the Christians there. Then in the rest of verses 15 and 16, Paul, in a more generalized way, uh, looks at those persecutors. He says they do not please God. And they're contrary to, to all men. You, you think about this forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. Pause a moment. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to plant a seed maybe for you to think about. Paul is reminding Gentile Christians, you know, the, the Judeans who are against the church, who are against Jesus, are, are so against Jesus, they don't want us to come to you, and they don't even believe what we're saying. They don't even believe that's true, but they don't want us to come to you. They, they are, they're so bent. They are so twisted. They are so warped. Look at what they've done. They are contrary to all men. And then he goes on to say, so as to always fill up the, the measure of their sins, but the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Paul is saying, look at what they've done. Look at how they've opposed the gospel. And punishment is going to come their way for it, and, and that would absolutely happen. Paul was writing to these Christians saying, you're facing opposition in the world in which you live. And you know, Jesus said that was going to happen. In John chapter 15 and verse 19, He said to His disciples, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, he said, therefore the world hates you. And, and that was true. When we look at the early church, we see the persecutions that they endured. We see, we see the, the trials and difficulties they had. And in the world today, there are members of the Lord's body, His church, I don't just mean what is often referred to as Christendom, but I mean the body of Christ who, who live recognizing they, they could have their freedom taken away at any moment. They could lose their life simply for following Jesus. That exists. Now you and I in the United States, we haven't faced anything close to that. I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm truly glad for that. But we have brethren who, who do endure that. But, but instead you and I face opposition. We face perhaps mistreatment, people looking down on us because we follow Christ. People may be looking down on us because we follow the teaching of the New Testament, even though it's not terribly popular in our culture. Our culture teaches a lot of things that are against what the Scriptures say. And so we face that. We, we face mistreatment, and it would be easy to just give up. It would be easy to stop following Jesus and say, okay, that's it, I'm done. I'm tired of being pushed out, being ostracized from my group of friends. I'm tired of, uh, of having to feel like that there's, that there's a large movement in my country that's trying to, to push us to the side. So I'm just going to quit following those things. Paul wrote to those Christians, he said, I'm so thankful you endured. And I look at you and I say, I'm so thankful you have endured. Let's keep enduring. I know it's not the way we wanted it to be sometimes. I know sometimes the treatment that comes our way as the Lord's people isn't, isn't what we would like it to be or what it was 50 years ago. I, I recognize that. But let's endure. Let's stand firm. What, what does that mean? Think with me about what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. 1 Corinthians 9, beginning with verse 24, he wrote, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. We an incorruptible. What are you talking about, Paul? He's using athletics. Maybe not the best illustration to use on Super Bowl Sunday. But, but he's using athletics to bring across a point of the Christian life. He says, you know, when people run in a race, they all run, but, but there's a prize for the winner. He says, I want you all, Christians, to run to obtain it. Somebody says, wait, you said one receives the prize. What about the rest of us? You missed the point. Christ won the prize already. Christ died to take away our sins. He wins the victory for us. And if we will run the race, He gives us the crown. Now those in the games, 
the ones who run, the ones who uh, are involved in, in the other elements of those Greek games would receive the perishable or corruptible crown. That laurel wreath that was placed on the head of the victor in the games. But Paul says, if you'll be faithful, you receive an incorruptible crown. You get a crown that will never fade away. Christian, whether we're talking about opposition to teaching the gospel or simply to living the life of a child of God, we're talking about the hardships and the heartbreak that sometimes comes our way that are simply part and parcel of living in this world. You have endured. And there is reason for that because there is a crown that is waiting for you. That's why Paul was thankful for his brethren. That is exactly why you and I should be thankful for one another today and encourage and strengthen one another to say, keep on enduring. Paul was thankful for his brethren. They received God's Word. And they endured when trials came their way. That's a pretty good overview of what we need to do. That's a pretty good look. If, if you just want to sum it up, encapsulate it into a thought as to what our life should be to receive God's Word as God's Word. And in receiving, it's built in that we're going to apply it, we're going to do it, we're going to follow through, and then we endure. No matter what may come our way, we keep serving the Lord. It's what Paul wrote to the Christians at Thessalonica, and it's exactly what I need and what we need in our lives. Let's receive God's Word as God's Word. We hear it. We understand that, that it's not from men, it is from God, and so we obey it, recognizing that Jesus came to the earth, He went to the cross, He shed His blood to take away our sin, and so we come to Jesus to do what the Bible says to do. We hear the Word of God and believe. We repent of our sins and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and we're buried with Him in baptism for the remission of our sins. We come to Him receiving His Word and doing that. When we do that, our sins are washed away, not because we're so great, but because the blood of Jesus was shed and His blood washes away our sins. That's the reasonable response to the Word of God. When we recognize that, that this is in fact His Word, that, that this is not just a collection of sayings, but, but this is the inspired Word of God, the reasonable response is, I need to come to Christ as the Scriptures teach. And then we endure. We continue to follow Jesus. We, we continue to walk in Him, even if it means there are days in which we endure some sort of suffering, some sort of pain. We keep on following Jesus. Whether we're talking about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Stay in Him. Stay with Him. Or even what Jesus said to the church at Smyrna, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, He said to them, you're going to suffer. You're going to face trials and tribulation. He said at the end of the verse, He said, but be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. There's that crown. There's that imperishable crown of victory that has been won by Jesus that He gives to us as we remain faithful to Him. And that is the message for every one of us as Christians. Be faithful to Jesus. Keep following Him. Don't let go. Paul said to the Christians at Thessalonica, I'm so thankful for you. I'm thankful that you received God's Word. I'm, I'm thankful that you've endured in living the Christian life. Let's be sure that we do that. If you need to come to Christ to be cleansed of your sin by His blood, you can do that right now. You can come and, and be buried with Him in baptism, rising to walk in newness of life. If you as a Christian have not been faithful, come home. Repent of your sin. Confess it. He will forgive you. For all of us as Christians, let's keep walking in the Lord, doing His will. Won't you come? as we stand and as we sing.